Welcome. Yes. <laughs> Oh, now, Jonathan, something oh. just popped up. Meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. Okay. Um, just, here we go. Okay. Yep, it's working. Okay. So, uh, welcome, everybody. This is our second week um, in this little three-week series on uh the Passion of Christ as depicted in art and film. So last week, um, we looked at the uh, Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane, the prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and we looked at one of the most famous pieces of art in the world, I guess, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, that fresco, it's in Milan. And then um, Angela also um, showed us some pictures of Christ in the Garden uh, of Gethsemane. So that was great. And so tonight we're going to pick it up with his um, arrest and his um, betrayal and his uh, trial and scourging. So let me see now. I'm going to share the screen so we can see some of these pieces of art. Let's see. Uh, um, all right, so I'm gonna go here to slideshow and there we go. All right, so Passion of Christ in Art and Film Week Two. I tell you what, before uh, we get into it, let's uh, say a little prayer. Gracious God, thank you for a time of looking at the passion of Christ and um, looking at the Bible and also some ways that um, it's been depicted in art and film. So bless us tonight, God. Give us maybe a deeper appreciation for your love for us as you poured it out for us in our Lord's passion and maybe through some of these beautiful works of art to gain a better sense of, of what it was like and what we might learn about the Bible this evening. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. There we go. So before we um, get too much into this, let me get my Bible. Should have gotten that before we started. Sorry about that. Okay. Does everybody see the screen that I'm sharing? Okay, so I want to read from Matthew chapter 26. And beginning with verse 47. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 47. Here we go. So, and as, as we're looking at um, the passion story of Jesus tonight, we're going to be looking mostly at Matthew. Occasionally we'll look at John or Luke, but most of what we'll read tonight is from, from Matthew. So Matthew 26, beginning with verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, greetings rabbi and kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? 
Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Okay. So this painting um, is called The Taking of Christ by Caravaggio. Um, Caravaggio was an Italian artist who lived in the early, well, the late 16th and early 17th century. Um, you see this was done in the year 1602. And we're gonna be looking not only at this piece of art tonight, but a couple of other pieces of art by Caravaggio. He's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, what do you notice? Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna check on Facebook to see if anybody's leaving comments. But what do you notice um, about this painting? Anything in particular? Whoops. Let's see. Um, so this is the moment uh, of Jesus' arrest, and so who would this be? Judas. This is Judas. You see he's about to kiss Jesus, and here is Jesus. One of the things that um, a group earlier today noticed about this was this armor. You notice this armor that this soldier is wearing? Mm -hmm. um, and it makes you wonder, and this soldier also really seems to be wearing a helmet of some kind, um, it makes you wonder why, why they needed armor. I mean, Jesus is defenseless. He's the only, one of the things we notice about Jesus in this is that, see his hands? Yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's just got his hands folded. Um, he's not he's not resisting arrest at all. He's just kind of folded in resignation. He's not fighting back at all. He's just kind of got his hands folded. But yet the soldiers <laughs> they they feel the need to have this this armor. Anyway, um, the only source of light in this, one of the things about Caravaggio, he was famous for uh, his use of light and shadows. Uh, to create depth and also motion uh, that kind of invites us into the painting. One of the things about Renaissance art, and this was considered part of the Renaissance, um, there is depth in the paintings. Um, the medieval art, and we're going to look some at medieval art also, but it's kind of flat and two-dimensional, but Renaissance art, they really wanted to invite the viewer into the story to more fully experience the story. And so um, not a whole lot in this one, but in some of the other Caravaggio paintings, we'll notice the depth and how he uses light and shading and angles and lines uh, to create a sense of depth, like three-dimensional. Um, what do y'all think? Um, about Fran and Patsy, I'd be interested in if you had any thoughts. What do you think about this guy? What do you think he's doing on the left? Mm, trying to hold the crowd back. <laughs> okay, that's one way to interpret the, the uh, painting. Uh, you're, you were, you're muted there, Angela. What do you think he's doing on the left? Mm, trying to hold the crowd back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's one way to interpret this. Oops. So yeah, that's, I think there's, he's trying to hold the crowd back too. That's what I said. Right. And yeah, and that's so that's what Angela said when she first saw it too. Well, one of the things about Caravaggio is that he will paint a large scene, but he will focus in on just a small part of it. He will focus in, uh, and the whole canvas will be dedicated just to three or four characters. Usually, they're part of a large crowd, but he's gonna he's gonna narrow the scope and focus in on just a few characters. Um, so, because he wants to show kind of a psychological intensity of emotion. Um, and so this guy, um, uh, he may be holding some people back, maybe trying to hold back some of the soldiers. I don't know. The, some of the art critics who have written about this 
say that he is one of the disciples who is fleeing away. You may remember there at the end of Matthew 26, verse 56, it said all the disciples fled him and, you know, basically deserted him. And they interpret this, this guy to be one of the disciples who's, who's fleeing the scene, getting out. Um, so don't know which one he is, but as my Old Testament teacher, Dr. Eford used to say, you pays your money, you takes your choices. So you can interpret it this, uh, this figure either way. Um, one of the things that we said uh, last week is that Jesus, in a lot of forms of art, he's wearing red and blue. And you see that here, his, he's wearing a red tunic and a blue kind of mantle around, around him. Um, not all pieces of art that we're going to look at are like that, but a lot of them are. And a lot of times they understood the blue. What do you associate with blue? Fran or Patsy, any ideas? Darkness. Darkness. What, what else might you associate with blue? Like um, the skies? Yeah. So um, a lot of times blue stands, reminds us of the skies and the heavenly places and blue sometimes represents um, Christ's divine nature, uh, heavenly nature, he's fully divine. And the red reminds us of his human nature. The red reminds us of his blood, um, his martyrdom. And so a lot of, in a lot of pieces of art, we see him with red and blue representing his humanity and his divinity. Um, I guess I never knew that he wore red and blue. I don't recall seeing pictures like that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. There's not all of them are like that, um, but a good many of them are. They'll have him wearing a red inner garment, and he's kind of got a blue mantle wrapped about him. And that was one way they had of showing his kind of his human side and his divinity. Um with this, and there again, you see the light on Jesus' forehead, the darkness just below his eyebrows, but you see his kind of furrowed forehead here, and Judas also, uh, you see the, the detail that Caravaggio put in that, um, the intensity of emotion. Um, the only light that is in this picture, source of light, is this fellow over here. Um, he's holding a lantern like this to see, and he looks kind of curious. He wants to see what's going on. Um, uh, and that's the only source of light. And Caravaggio was uh, someone who used light, and he used like beams of light to draw lines to direct our attention. So, our attention is, of course, being directed towards Jesus. He's the only figure who's, um, well, he's not the only figure, but he's one of the few figures in this painting whose face is illumined. Others are kind of dark or hidden. But Jesus' face is illumined. And, and Judas is kind of covered up by this big bushy beard. <laughs> so anyway, so that's, that's one, one picture of, uh, the arrest of Jesus by Caravaggio. So here's a stained glass window of the arrest of Jesus. And you see here Judas kissing him. Uh, of course, Jesus said, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? And he did. You see here, and this is not Renaissance art. This is more medieval art. It's from a stained glass window in, in Germany. Um, but you see many, many times, and of course, Jesus not wearing red and blue here. This is medieval art, and they didn't, they didn't usually do that. But um, many times with stained glass windows or sometimes other pieces of art, uh, Jesus has the kind of halo effect around his head. Um, this figure of Judas here, I didn't, I don't, I didn't include a picture of Judas this way, but sometimes he's, Judas is featured with, um, a black halo effect around his head. Uh, so it's like um, the opposite of Jesus' goodness is, is Judas. 
Judas really is presented very negatively, of course, in most pieces of art. And these are, who do you think these folks are? And these. Probably said Gary. <laughs> that, that's what I thought too. Um, these are the soldiers that came to arrest Jesus. Someone in the earlier group today said, oh no, that's not the soldiers coming to arrest Jesus. She said, uh, don't you notice there are 11 of these white pointy hats <laughs> and they're Judas. Together they would make the 12 disciples. Yep, you're right. So once again, maybe that maybe these are the disciples or maybe these are soldiers coming to arrest Jesus. So if, if this is one of the disciples, he, you see him holding Jesus' arm here. Maybe he's trying to snatch Jesus away from Judas. Um, or maybe he's, uh, maybe he's a soldier trying to carry him away or trying to arrest him. Don't know. You can interpret it either way. But as one of the things I said last week is that most Christians throughout history were not able to read. They certainly didn't have a Bible they could take home and read, especially before Gutenberg, the printing press. Um, but most Christians learned the biblical stories through the arts through um, stained glass windows, painting, sculptures, music, um, and of course, and also listening uh, to sermons, of course, too. So all, all of these different ways of experiencing the scripture was how people learned the biblical stories. They didn't have a Bible they took home and read. Um, having a Bible that you can take home and read is a relatively recent thing uh, in the Christian history. Most Christians have just learned the Bible stories through the arts. And that's, that's what we're doing, kind of learning more about the Bible stories through the arts. Uh, there's another um, paint. Uh, this is a fresco uh, at a chapel called Scrovenji Chapel. I think it's in Florence, Italy. And um, this is from an earlier period, like around 1300 by Giotto. Um, and one of the, you see the, the swords, or I should say the, uh, what does he call them? Um, torches. Yeah, torches, torches. Because Jesus said at one point, why do you come out with swords and torches and clubs? Uh, I was in the temple all day and you didn't arrest me then, but this is the hour of darkness. And so that you see all these torches or clubs or spears or rods or um, other, I don't know what, the, some kind of military weapons um, all arrayed against Jesus. Um, but what is striking for a lot of people is here in the middle, the way that Judas and Jesus are just kind of staring at each other. They're kind of locked into this, um, this gaze into each other's eyes is very striking. And Judas is trying almost, it seems, to envelop Jesus within his, within his cloak. Uh, but Jesus doesn't flinch. He does not flinch. He doesn't even bat an eye. He looks directly at Judas. Um, so a striking contrast between good and evil. This, um, this pose, this, this um, way that Jesus is depicted here in direct opposition to Judas, but yet face to face with him. Um, so this is uh, an interesting figure here. It almost looks like a woman, but we can't exactly tell. Um, but he or she is pulling at one of the drapes or garments of somebody. You see the skies are, are turning dark. They were light maybe for a while, but they're kind of at twilight. This is the time where light starts to turn into darkness with the arrest of Jesus. Here is um, the denial of St. Peter and also about Caravaggio. So let me, let me just read just a little bit of the biblical story about what happened at this time. Let's see, Matthew 26, beginning with verse 69. Says this, 
Uh, now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystander came up and said to Peter, certainly you are also one of them for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So uh, again, this is by Caravaggio. You see Judas is kind of at an angle that gives it a little depth. You see once again, his pattern of striking uh, light and shadows to create an effect. Um, the, this man seems to be pointing, uh, maybe he's about to point at Peter. Uh, this woman is apparently the servant girl that we just read about who was saying, weren't you with Jesus earlier? Um, and she's pointing, I lost my curve, there we go. She's pointing at Peter with both of her hands. Um, Peter, this gesture that Peter has of his hands coming inward like this, um, what do you think Peter's saying at this point? Not me. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know the man. Uh, this, what do you think this is? A curtain. Curtains, maybe. Could be the fire. It says that Peter was um, warming himself by the fire or the charcoal fire. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe these are sparks from the fire. I don't know. Um, but that could be the source of the light that we see. It's interesting, you know, uh, we see this especially in John's gospel, but um, Jesus is the light of the world. But here, Peter is denying the one who's like the light of the world, but he's ser searching for a little bit of light in this little charcoal fire. Uh, so it's ironic that he would deny the, the one who's the light of the world, but yet look at this little tiny little speck of light in this charcoal fire. Later, we, we, when Jesus, after his resurrection, he, he also starts a little charcoal fire. Uh, at the seaside to cook breakfast for the disciples. And it's his way of reminding Peter, hey, remember what happened the last time you were beside a charcoal fire? Yeah, you denied me three times. Uh, and Jesus gives him a chance to affirm his love three times. But this is Peter. You, you may notice, um, does Peter look like a young man or an older man or what would you, middle age, what would you think in this picture? Oh, I think he's in his 50s. <laughs> yeah. May even be 60. Yeah. You know, and we don't usually think of Peter being that old, right? Mm -hmm. We think of Peter roughly the same age as Jesus. And Jesus was in his early 30, 30 to 33, mm -hmm. somewhere in there during his public ministry. And Peter is sometimes depicted as an older person. Uh, and we don't know exactly why some artists did that, but could be that Peter was understood to be the kind of the leader of the disciples. And so maybe they put some age on him as, uh, <laughs> as a way of um, showing that he was the elder, he was the leader, he's the leader of the disciples. But the, I've, I've never thought of Peter being any older than the other disciples, but he's often depicted that way in art. Ah, so this one is called Ecce Homo, uh, Behold the Man. 
uh, and it's by a 19th century Italian artist named Antonio Cesare uh, in 1880. And uh, this is Jesus. Who do you think this figure is? Probably Pontius Pilate. Right, Pontius Pilate. And it's interesting in this picture, um, we're behind the scenes looking out. We're not from the perspective of the crowds out here in the streets, or there's some crowds even up here on these buildings mm -hmm. watching, but we're kind of behind the scenes. Um, and we don't get a good look at anybody's face except for one person. You see who that is? The woman. Yes, this woman here. Who do you think this woman might be? His mother. His mother? You mean or Jesus' Mary, mother? Or Mary Magdalene. Or Mary Magdalene, possibly, possibly. You know what some art critics have said about this woman? Do you remember another, a woman who in particular is associated with Pontius Pilate? There's a story, just a little part of the story. Let me see, from Matthew 27. It's just, she's just mentioned in a couple of verses. Uh, 27. Yeah. Uh, 27 through 26. I can't find it now. Anyway, there's a story about Pilate's wife. Do you remember anything about Pilate's wife? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> she had a dream. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She had a dream. And in this dream, somehow it was communicated to her, tell Pilate not to do this. This is an innocent man. Do not sentence this innocent man to death. And uh, it could be that this is Pilate's wife and she's the only one who really knows the truth. And everybody else we look at from behind, we only get a sideways or, or the back of their head. But this woman could be the only woman who knows the truth, um, that this is an innocent man. And a lot of our critics say that this is Pilate's wife. And there is a story in Matthew's at the end of Matthew in 27, uh, about Pilate's wife who, who sends a message to Pilate, hey, watch out, this man's an innocent man. Don't, don't, uh, uh, don't send him to death. But uh, anyway, um, so I thought this figure was, was interesting if she was Pilate's wife. But yet she looks sad, like she's resigned herself. And she's got her hand on this woman's shoulder and this woman is holding her arm. And Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, there are a lot of dreams. Uh, at the beginning of the gospel, Joseph has a dream. Uh, the wise men have a dream. Um, uh, there's just a lot of dream and uh, a lot of dreams in Matthew's gospel. And here at the end of Matthew's gospel, there, the Pilate's wife has a dream. Um, but Pilate proceeds anyway. Interesting pose here by Pilate. This seems to be his chair, the seat of authority. Of course, Pilate was the um, Roman governor of Judea. And we see this is a, can you tell what this is on the left? It's a Roman insignia, it's an eagle. It's kind of a symbol of Roman empire, the eagle. And uh, so this was a Roman court. Um, 
Roman soldiers, or at least a legion of soldiers, would often be led by uh, this insignia, this this uh, eagle. And Jesus says, when uh, when you see the the eagle circling around Jerusalem, leave, <laughs> head for the hills, and get out of there. What he was predicting was that in 70 AD, the Romans would encircle Jerusalem and that they would be, they would have their eagles uh, insignia around Jerusalem. And Jesus was warning people, when you see the eagles forming around uh, Jerusalem, get out, because what was going to happen was uh, Rome was about to destroy the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus saw that coming about 40 years ahead of time and, and warned his disciples. Whenever you see the eagles circling around Jerusalem, get out. Because they're about to destroy the city. Anyway. This is another Eche Homo. This Eche Homo was 1880. This Eche Homo, homo and of course, Eche Homo just means behold the man. Because that's what Pilate says. Behold the man. He presents um, Jesus to the uh, crowds. They're, they're, they're shouting, crucify him, crucify him. He has Jesus uh, scourged, whipped, and then he says, here's the man. It's interesting because in John's gospel, at least, um, it begins by John the Baptist saying, behold, the lamb. And it ends by Pilate saying, behold, the man. Um, this looks nothing like a Roman official. <laughs> so Caravaggio, some art critics say that he was painting um, uh, a Florentine official, uh, a politician that he didn't like very much. And he was saying that politician was so bad, he was going to make him like <laughs> the Pontius Pilate. And uh, what do you, what do you notice? What do you think this is in Jesus' hand? You notice this? A what? A staff. A staff. It's kind of like a staff. It's, uh, it's the, the gospels tell us that the soldiers put a reed in his hand. Oh, and, a reed. Oh, yeah. okay. And the reason they did that is a ruler like a king or even a governor would often, a symbol of his rule or reign was often a staff or a scepter. Um, but in order to mock Jesus, they said, oh, you're, if you're a king, well, you don't really have a scepter like a real king. You just have this reed. And a reed is uh, uh, kind of a weakened version of it. It's, it's something that's not very strong. So what, it's, it's a way of mocking him. So just like they, they put a crown on him, the crown of thorns, the irony of, of mocking a crown by using a crown of thorns. And in a similar way, they're mocking his... Um, uh, scepter by giving him a, a a reed instead of a real scepter. So it's just ways that they have of mocking Jesus by, by putting a reed in his hand. Is he taking it off or putting it on? That's a good question. Um, that is a really good question. We, we don't really know. Um, the, the group this morning noticed that too. And could be this guy is taking off Jesus' outer garment in order to um, whip him. Um, or maybe he's already been scourged and they're, they're putting that back on him. But we don't know. Good, good question. Don't really know. Once again, we see Jesus is all light. The light is illumining him, whereas the other figures are dark figures. So, and what did Pilate do? He washed his hands. <laughs> washed his hands. Washed um, his hands. Right, yeah, he did. Um, and this is Pilate washing his hands. You see that this, um, I guess this must be his servant or something. Um, taking a, a picture of some kind and pouring the water over his hands and it's being caught by this basin-like thing. 
it reminds me of when we baptize somebody and we pour water into a basin and we uh, dip, <laughs> dip our wet hands on the child's head. But uh, this is kind of the opposite of baptism. Um, this is Pilate saying, I'm not, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Not my fault. Um, this man's innocent. It's not my fault. I'm, I'm releasing myself of any responsibility. Um, and that's always been a biblical uh, metaphor for anybody who wants to distance themselves or say, I don't have anything to do with it, to just say, I'll wash my hands of it. Here is Jesus, uh, the flagellation of Christ, the, uh, the beating of Christ, the whipping of Christ. This was by uh, Peter Paul Rubens. Um, and here you see these guys got some muscles. <laughs> Sometimes, like in one of the previous pictures, Jesus was very skinny. Um, here is a, a more uh, robust Jesus, I guess. Um, but a couple of the things that I notice um, here, there's it's got kind of this swirling motion, swirling motion here. And you see the, the cord or the whip that this guy is using to whip Jesus. And this, um, this is one of the few places, you notice what this is? Yeah, somebody's foot. Somebody is either kicking Jesus or shoving him with their feet or something. But um, this is the only, this guy, what do you think he's doing? Any ideas? He looks like he's almost saluting. Maybe that's another way of mocking, of mocking him. And you notice what this is in the lower right-hand corner? I don't know if you can tell or not, but it's a dog. I don't know if you can tell that's a dog. Yeah. Um, so, and dogs are... In the Bible, uh, like the lowest, one of the lowest forms of animal life, a dog. Jesus said, "You don't take the uh, uh, children. Or you don't take the food from the children. Give it to the dogs. Dogs, mm -hmm. dogs are kind of a low life, and yet uh, they uh, maybe maybe a dog is depicted in this scene as a way of uh, insulting Jesus, treating him like a dog." Um, there's the same scene in stained glass. Uh, and again, this is that medieval church in Germany that this stained glass window is coming from. Again, he's got the same um, halo around him. Sometimes these are called Christ at the pole because he's tied to this pole as there is being beaten. This is Caravaggio again with the light and the darkness. This is uh, the name of this picture is the crowning with thorns. Let me move this. 1607. And uh, it's like they don't even want to touch the thorns themselves. They're using these rods, not only to put the thorns on his head, but to, to beat him with. And there you see he's in. He's in red, uh, perhaps, perhaps signifying his uh, impending martyrdom, his blood that's going to be spilled on the cross. And again, you see this reed that they put in his hand as a way to mock him. This fellow over here, I have no idea what he's there for. <laughs> he doesn't even look like he's from that time period at all. No, not yeah, he looks more like he's from Caravaggio's world, uh, 1600 years later with his dress. I like the feather. Yeah. Feather in his hat. Yep. And ruffles on his shirt. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, I see the ruffle sticking out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there again, you see this light coming, this beam of light coming from here up at the top. It's coming down, creating this angle and creating this uh, field of vision and the light striking Jesus. Whereas the others are are kind of hidden or dark or dark. But you see how their bodies are at angles and kind of twisted, giving it more depth. Mm -hmm. In contrast to that, uh, this one is uh, Piero della Francesca, the flagellation of Christ. It's from a um, little over 100 years earlier. And you see how much the, the art has developed. This has so much motion and um, it's a, it's a, uh, yeah, focusing on just a few subjects, narrow, a narrow focus, but this is wide and um, uh, more of a broad range. I don't know who in the world these three guys are. Any ideas? I have none. <laughs> Told you the only one I thought was the guy with the black cat is Caiaphas. Could be. Could be Caiaphas. The high the high priest. Priest. Yep. That's what I thought of. Yeah. But what's striking, one of the things that's striking to me about this particular uh, painting is how these three guys seem totally oblivious to what's going on here. And here is probably Pilate sitting in his chair, watching Jesus be uh, whipped and these three are totally oblivious, not paying any attention to it. It was like this, this column here divides, divides this painting in two. You've got one scene here, and you've got another scene here. Mm -hmm. The skies are, are, look, are light and blue right now, at least in this, in this picture. We're going to see in a little bit how the skies turn dark as the um, story continues to progress. And who do you think this guy is? Ooh, Must be Peter, because here's the cock. There's the chicken. The cock crowing. Um, and he's weeping bitterly. Don't even see his face. But yet they still they still put the halo around him. Mm -hmm. This is a mosaic from uh, Marco Rupnik. He and he's still alive now. He's uh, um, an artist in Italy. Um, we have a, a lot of Italian artists, don't we? <laughs> but uh, we're going to get to some American ones also in a little bit. But uh, he's he's still living today, um, and it's a mosaic, of course, made out of little tiny rocks and piece of glass, crying bitterly because he heard the cockroach. Always liked Peter, though I can identify with him. He was a he was a total failure in the Passion story, but yet Jesus turned him around, forgave him, and uh, made him such a rock of strength for the early church. And I told you that the sky would turn dark <laughs> as the story progresses, but uh, there's this is El Greco. Um, uh, the Greek, he was from Greece, but he lived out most of his adult life in Italy. Um, and this is Metropolitan Museum of Art um, in New York. But some of the things that we notice about this, the dark sky, the storm, as it were, um, we see this the cross kind of coming out towards us. It's a 3D effect. It's not, not flat. We're seeing him actually carrying the cross. Um, what do you notice about his eyes? Looking up, looking up, looking up heaven, heaven, heavenward. Um, 
it's, he's almost like praying for strength to endure this terrible, terrible burden that he's carrying. Um, some art historians say that he's actually got tears in his eyes. And I don't know if you can tell, but it does look like yes. some moisture in his eyes, tears in his eyes. And we see again, he's red and blue, the humanity and the spilled blood and the, but it's wrapped in, um, wrapped in, the red is wrapped in blue, his divinity. He's got uh, elongated fingers. Mm. Angela, tell, tell them what you were telling me earlier about your impressions about this painting. Oh, um, I think in some pictures and even in this one, uh, to me, those look like feminine looking hands. They're pretty hands. <laughs> um, and uh, they don't look at, my, I've got short, uh, my hands don't look like that, but I envision those are, are pretty feminine. And, and I think it's also to describe Jesus' um, humility and weakness, which is often uh, wrongly interpreted with feminine traits. But those are, it almost looks like he's got fingernails, long fingernails too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Interesting. Um, all of one of the things that we mentioned last week is that different artists, as they're depicting Jesus, usually uh, depict him with forms of culture that they that they're familiar with, like. Most of these pictures, they're not really of a Palestinian Jewish man. They're more like European, <laughs> a European white Jesus, not a Palestinian uh, uh, Jew. But oftentimes we depict Jesus in ways that reflect our own time and place and culture. Um, but uh, one of the artists from this century, Vincent Barzoni, uh, depicted a black Jesus. Um, and uh, I thought it was interesting. He, he um, um, compared the, uh, the sufferings of Jesus uh, to the experience of, of black people in this country. So just another interpretive lens. Um, there was one, <laughs> there was one, I don't know if any of you ever watched the 70s sitcom show, Good Times, um, but there's one, um, there was one episode where Mike, where JJ, who was an artist, painted a black Jesus. Uh, and uh, uh, Michael, his little brother Michael, was showing you there. But we all, in some ways, uh, think of Jesus in terms of our own cultural landscape. And uh, so those are just some examples of that, too. I'm going to try to, we've got just a few minutes left. Um, I'm going to try, I was going to show, we, we said we were going to be looking at Christ, um, through art and film, and I haven't used any film yet, but I'm going to just, I don't know if any of you remember the 1977 miniseries called Jesus of Nazareth that appeared, um, on NBC, mm -hmm. but, uh, if I can show this to you. Uh, let's see. Well, huh. can't get it to come up. Oh, wait a minute. I was going to share you, show you just a couple minutes of. Oh, do, 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 do. Here we go. This film, Jesus of Nazareth. There, can you see that? Oh, yeah. Oh, here's Matt and Jessica. Well, or that didn't look so great. Right. You're annoying, friend. <laughs> I'm talking about the friends who never have weight issues, who never set foot in a gym, 
who can live off. Well, that <laughs> I was going to show you a YouTube video, but an ad popped up. <laughs> oh, well, you, you can see it later if you want to. But um, one of the interesting pieces of film um, about the life of Jesus was uh, Jesus of Nazareth. It came out in 1977, it was on NBC miniseries. And I was just going to show you um, just a couple minutes of it and how it depicted Jesus' passion, his arrest, and his um, uh, his uh, um, uh, trial in front of Pilate. But you can see that later on if you want to. <laughs> I remember. All right. Any other comments or questions about any of the pieces of art that we looked at or the ways that uh, Jesus was depicted? I think Fran or Patsy said they remembered it. I remember, no. I couldn't I, hear I you, Angela. Uh, maybe. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. To boost my metabolism, oh. the thing I call carb confusion. Using carbs Still to good. speed up your results. So if you're trying to crank up your metabolism. There. <laughs> trying to get rid of that. Rainer Patsy was trying to say something, Jonathan. Okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, I remember, and I'm about to reveal my age, but in the <laughs> 50s, I remember um, my dad and my mother and my sister and me going to the drive-in to watch the crucifixion on the big screen. And this was, I was just a young child, but that has uh -huh. stayed with me my whole life. And uh, that's one of the things that I remember doing with my dad because he passed away when I was 14. So oh. um, we, you know, that's just one thing that stands out. And that's always uh, gets me around this time of the year when we see this and go through Easter. Yeah. Fran, do you remember what the name of the film was that you saw? No, but I would like to, I, I may try to research it and see if I can find it because I re, I, I just remember I, I'm, I couldn't have been more than eight or nine if I was that old, but yeah. might have been eight or nine because um, it was around that time that I, I uh, chose Jesus as my savior when I was about 10. So I don't remember <laughs> you know exactly when but i just remember yeah. that my sister wife she has a memory like an elephant so <laughs> yeah that's great and yeah. you know so it's it could be that even just seeing the story visually touched you know a different way than just reading words or anything oh, how definitely. important it is <laughs> oh definitely yeah yeah um you know, I think that, I don't know if this was the movie or not, but I don't know if this time frame would make sense, but the movie, uh, The Greatest Story Ever Told, um, came out in 1965. Um, and I don't know if that time frame, but that's one, one of the uh, movies about Jesus' life um, from the 1960s, I think 65, was that The Greatest Story Ever Told. Oh, I remember seeing that, I believe, uh, on television, maybe, mm -hmm. or at the theater. I don't remember, but I do remember, but yeah. And there was also one called The Robe. Yep. Yeah. Came out in 53. Ah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That was shown on the big screen. Uh-huh. That might have been it. Like I said, I was just a child. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. I just it was released by 20, 20th Century Fox We're under the Cinescope, which was a big deal at the time. Yeah, it's it's interesting that um, the way that film can leave an impression on us, like it obviously did you. Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. One of one of the ways that God reaches us, you know, so often we we assume that the Bible is words that we hear, and that and it's true, it is, but that engages only one of our senses. But um, another, uh, it's good to experience God's word in all of our senses, uh, sight, um, 
even in church when we smell and touch something in communion, we're experiencing uh, Christ with using our different senses. Um, but certainly visual represent representations of Christ can leave a powerful effect on us. All right, well, um, that's all for now. Next week, um, we're gonna look at the crucifixion. Uh, we've looked at Gethsemane, We've looked at his um, arrest and trial and torture, really. And next week, we'll go look at Gethsemane. And uh, Angela will show us several works of art and how that's depicted as well. So. And then the plan, the plan is in two weeks, uh, Pastor Lauren will, will do the, the beloved one. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.